But in Acts chapter 2, let's look at the first uh, 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 five verses. So let's uh, stand and we'll read those five, first five verses together responsibly this morning. I'll begin in verse 1, join me in verse 2. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's read verse 5 together. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this scripture. Thank you for this chapter of the Bible that will draw our attention today. Uh, Holy Spirit of God, I just pray that you'd have complete liberty to move among us and stir us as you see fit. I pray that, Lord, you convict the lost today of their condition uh, uh, before you. Lord, uh, that they would realize that they're lost and undone and can do nothing to save themselves. But, Lord, help them to realize uh, uh, because of your love that you've done everything to save them. And I pray that, Lord, they quickly come to Jesus Christ in faith. For the saint here today, Lord, that's struggling, I pray that, Lord, you give us strength. For the, uh, the saint that's wounded, I pray for healing. For the, uh, the saint that's weak, I pray for strength. For the saint that's wandering, I pray for just confirmation. Lord, uh, whatever it is today, I just pray that, Lord, you, through the preaching and uh, uh, the hearing and the doing of your word, would receive all the honor and glory for our meeting here today. And, Jesus, we want to thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for laying down your life on Calvary's old rugged cross and suffering death and, and suffering the punishment of our sins upon your body, dying for our sins. And, and Heavenly Father, thank you for raising Jesus Christ from the dead to, uh, to prove that you accepted his death as payment for our sins. Oh, thank you for the gift of eternal life today. I am thank you, Lord, that it's not a gift that we have to work for, uh, something that we have to try to earn on our own merits, but something that, because of your grace, is freely extended to all men and to all, to all, uh, all folks everywhere. And, Lord, today I pray that you'd help me to lift up Jesus Christ. To help you, I pray that you'd help me to glorify your name and magnify your word. And most of all, Lord, I just pray that you'd be pleased to meet with us in a special way. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, in this passage of Scripture and in Acts chapter 2, we've come to the great day of Pentecost. And uh, I want to just say this real quickly as we look at these verses here. Uh, there's a couple things going on uh, uh, that, that we need, uh, need some clarification on, need some teaching on, and I don't mind taking some time to teach. But the day of Pentecost, first of all, uh, was the day where the promise of God was fulfilled. Uh, in verse number uh, 1, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, rushing mighty wind, as it, and it filled all, uh, all the house where they were sitting. And, and so we see the promise that, that was given to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, was now being fulfilled. When God makes a promise, God fulfills a promise. You just mark it down. If God said it, it's going to come to pass. Everything that He, everything that he says will be done. And we, we just had our conference on prophecy with Dr. Hiltabittle, all those things that were talked about, all those verses that were read regarding the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, regarding everything that God said he was going to do or allow to happen in this world, these things will come to pass. We have God's word on it, and that's all we need on it. I know when I was growing up and first saved, uh, there was a common statement going around, and people would say in the, in the church I was going to, God's word said it, I believe it, that settles it. I've learned, I've learned since then to take myself out of the equation. God said it, that settles it, amen? And so uh, when God, uh, God's word and, and the Son of God promised the disciples that they would be filled, uh, they were being filled here in chapter number two. Look back to chapter number one and verse number eight. He said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. They were going to be given power to do the will of God. Let me just say this. God does not give power to entertain. God does not give power uh, so that we can marvel at it just for the power's sake. God gives his power to accomplish his purposes. God gave them power so that they could testify of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is exactly what is happening here in chapter number 2. He gave them power. He filled them with the Holy Ghost so that they could testify of Jesus Christ to all of these people that would gather that were gathered together in Jerusalem so that they could be told of, of the importance of who Jesus Christ was and all that he did and what God did with him and how they could be saved as well. Let me just say this. God's plan, uh, as identified by the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said, I'm coming to the world. Uh, the Son of Man's come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why Christ came. He did not come to start a religion. He did not come to be uh, admired as a religious leader. 
He came to save men from their sins, and he accomplished that by going to an old rugged cross on top of Golgotha and laid down his life there and was crucified there and died there. And then after being buried in, in, in a borrowed tomb for three days and three nights, he was raised by the power of God and now offers salvation to any and all that would come to faith in him. That is a simple plan, uh, but a very powerful plan that God had to save mankind. They were going to testify of this. So we see in, in, in verses 1 to 3, we see that the promise from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 fulfilled. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and that power is for this reason. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. And we're going to see that they're now going to testify of Jesus Christ here in Jerusalem. So we see the promise fulfilled. Not only do we see the promise fulfilled, but look with me at verse number 4. As they're all filled with the Holy Ghost... They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I was asked a question yesterday by a man in our Bible study over the prison. Uh, he was asking about the, the baptizing or being baptized in the Holy Ghost or being filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me just say this. A person in our day and age, according to the economy of Scripture, uh, in our day and age, when a man or a woman or child comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment they do so, they are adopted into the family of God. They become a child of God. And we understand this according to John chapter 1, where the Bible says, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus Christ, to them gave he power. That word power there means privilege or the standard to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Makes sense. Amen? So the moment a person trusts Christ as their Savior, they are born in the family of God. They are fulfilling what Jesus Christ told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Amen? So we're adopted into the family of God, regarded as God's children. But here's something interesting. Our bodies then become the dwelling place or the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. That's awesome. God fulfills his promise uh, in, in Hebrews uh, 13, 5, I will never leave thee and never forsake thee. Why? Because he has taken up residence inside of our bodies. The Holy Spirit does not live here at 1015 Lowry Avenue. He does not live in the church house. And I don't say this, I don't, I don't mean to be critical or, or harsh in any way. Uh, uh, this is not the house of God. This is the church house. This is where the church meets. But this is not the house of God. This is the house of God. And if you're saved, you are the house of God. The Holy Spirit goes with you everywhere you go. The Holy Spirit indwells you. Now, again, can he fill you? Of course he can. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, which means they had to be emptied of themselves. You can't fill a, 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 a container with two things at once it, it, uh, and, and be completely full of one thing. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, which means that he was filling them. Amen? They weren't partly full of themselves and partly full of the Holy Ghost. No, they were completely full of the Holy Ghost. How does that happen? When we empty ourselves of sin and self. That ought to be the desire of every child of God. To get rid of me so I can get more of him. Like John the Baptist said, he said, I must decrease, but he must increase. If we'd adopt that philosophy, we'd be looking through our lives saying, Lord, what displeases you? What defeats uh, your purpose in my life? What discourages me from following you? And then be willing to turn that over, be willing to forsake that, being willing to repent of that as the Holy Spirit brings that to our attention. That is a challenge of the Christian life. Amen? And, and Paul very beautifully and very painfully describes that for us in Romans chapter 7. He said, the things that I want to do, I can't do those. The things that I tell other people not to do are the things I find myself doing. Why? Uh, he said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. He said, there's a flesh that's fighting all the spiritual desires that the Holy Spirit would ever uh, uh, bring up or draw up inside of me. And so I've got to fight those. How often do you have to fight those, Pastor Ross? Once a week for an hour. We fight those 724. See, that's why God's not interested in your religion. You're a pastor. Can you say that? I'll say it again. God's not interested in your religion. He wants a relationship. And he doesn't want that relationship just to be contained in one hour a week. He wants to walk with you. Yes, through today. This is the Lord's day. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. But every day is the Lord's day. This is the day we commemorate Christ's resurrection from the dead. This is called the Lord's Day in the Word of God. We don't, we don't meet on this day because some uh, church said this is when we're supposed to worship or some church issued an edict and said all Christians have to worship on this day. We worship on this day because this is the day when the saints gather together. And this is in the Bible, amen. It's called the Lord's Day. That's why we, 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 we follow that, 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 that pattern, amen, because it's something that's mentioned in Scripture. But I'll tell you what, God's interested in more than just Sunday with us. He wants to meet us on Monday morning. He liked, to, he liked to walk through Tuesday with us. Hey, Wednesday night, he'd like to be part of that evening as well. Thur Thursday, mid-morning, guess what? He he'd like to be part of that too. Friday, all day long, amen? Saturday too. And, and of course, Sunday. 
See, uh, we, 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 we have a God that's interested not in religion, not just interested in being boxed in a certain time or a certain day of the week or for certain activities, but he wants to be part of everything that we do. Young people, let me just tell you this, and, and I'll just say this to everybody, adults as well. Stop putting God in boxes. Stop confining him. Stop restraining him. Let him be a part of everything. Uh, don't, don't just limit God's power to the church house. Don't just limit God to a certain day of the week. Don't just limit God to certain activities or, or, or certain uh, uh, traditions and things like that. I mean, God ought to be a part of everything. I mean, he ought to be sitting with us at our, at our, at our, at our tables at mealtime. We ought to be acknowledging him here for, for the bounty that he gives us. He, he ought to be included in our prayers when we put our head on our pillow at night asking for his protection and watch care. Students, he ought to be the one you consult before you take your test. Now, don't ask him to bless something he can't bless. Well, I'm not going to study. I'm just going to pray. You, friend, you've got nothing. Don't expect to do well on that, amen? He gave you a mind and gave you teachers and gave you time. You study. You do your best and let God take care of the results. Amen? He had to, he had to go with us into the workhouse. Amen? Help me to do my best for my boss. This, this, let me just say this real quickly. I, I'm just going to irritate some people today. I don't really mind really much right now. But uh, this, this adversarial relationship between employees and employers is of the devil. The Bible tells us we're supposed to go in there and be pleasing to our masters in all things. That word masters there, we don't have the, 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 the identical relationship that they had in, in Bible times. The dynamic there is not the same. But if we carry it over and, and, and bring it into our modern society, those that are our employers are like our masters, our bosses. And guess what? We owe it to them to, to do our best. Why? Because we're not working just for them. We're working for our Lord God, which is in heaven. And what and the Bible tells us in our principle is this. Whatsoever our hand finds to do, do with our might. Amen. Why? Because we're working under the Lord, not under men. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm, my boss is, is, is working me over, so I'm going to work him over. He's not treating me fair, so I'm not going to treat him fair. If it's that bad, then you find some other place to work, and you find some other boss you can work for and give your best to. Pastor, that's just not fair. Uh, can you ch- quote me chapter and verse where anything is fair? Uh, Miss Ellen, I've read through my Bible a bunch of times, and I'm, I'm going through it again and again, and I've read through Proverbs Many, many times in Psalms, many times. It's not in there, amen. Life is fair. I didn't see that anywhere in the Bible. Anybody, anybody get, if you found that, would you let Pastor know? Because I'm just a little dumb, a little slow. If you found that verse, chapter and verse, I will make it my life's verse. Life is fair. I'll make it my life's verse. We okay? Life isn't fair. But you know what? When you meet the inequities of life and the unfairness of life, guess what? There's a God in heaven that's just. There's a God in heaven that knows you, knows what you're going through, and guess what? He will take care of sorting everything out and making sure everything works out for your good and his glory. We still have Romans 8, 28 in the Bible. We know that all things work together for good, even the bad things, even the harmful things, even where we get shafted. God has a way of turning that out for his good and our glory. We okay? We have enough faith to believe that he can save our souls from hell, amen? We should have enough faith to believe that he can carry us through life. Oh, you're loving me right now. Let's go on a little further here, amen? We see the promise fulfilled. Now we see the, the preaching further. They were, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we're talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. We need to be emptied of self. They were. They were. Let me just say this. They were in the right frame of mind. They were in the right spirit, not only with God, but with each other. If we want to see revival, guess what? It, it, it's, going to take a personal, it's going to take personal effort on all of our parts to be right with God, but also right with one another. The, the great church at Corinth, probably, probably the greatest church as far as, as finances go in the Bible, as far as gifts in the Bible, there was no church that they took second place to. They were a phenomenal church. They were a powerhouse, okay? But they were also the most fractured church in the Bible because they had schisms. They had people saying, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, well, I'm of Jesus. And they all, they all, they all clicked off and went into their, their, their little cliques. And, and, and Paul said there was divisions in there, schisms in there. Why? Because they had, they had subdivided themselves. Uh, the, the church here in Jerusalem did not subdivide themselves. They were all in one accord in one place. And they weren't, they weren't, uh, they weren't personality driven. They weren't uh, uh, driven or, or divided by these things. They're all in one accord in one place. And so they were right with God and they were right with one another. And because they were this way, the Holy Ghost was able to fill them. And because the Holy Ghost was able to fill them, he was able to then use them to bring about an incredible miracle on the day of Pentecost. Let me just say this. I've talked to some that are uh, of the charismatic bent that disagree with me vehemently on this one. But let me just say that the great miracle on the day of Pentecost is not the speaking in tongues. It was the salvation of 3,000 souls. 
I've argued with people about this, and I'm just, I scratch my head and say, you are glorifying the gift, and you're not seeing to the end of the, the intention of the gift. The gift was not to be glorified. The giver was to be glorified. And the reason that the gift was given was to be glorified, the salvation of souls. So how do we see this preaching furthered here? The Bible says they're all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Other tongues means foreign languages. Write in your Bible, write the notes in your Bible, and it does not mean uh, uh, Fred Flintstone language, yabba dabba do. It has nothing to do with that. Amen. It's not some spiritual mumbo jumbo that only God can understand, so the, devil, so the devil can't understand. Let me just say this I can speak plainly to God in English, not really caring about what the devil hears because God's purposes cannot be defeated. I'm not worried about the devil overhearing my prayers. Right. And if you are, increase your faith. What I pray, the devil cannot hinder if God is in it. Amen. So it's not some spiritual mumbo jumbo like you say, Pastor, you're aiming. I'm, yeah, whatever. But it's just a whole lot of nonsense out there about, about what's going on here. I had a gentleman ask me, Do you believe in speaking in tongues? I said, Yeah, I speak in the tongue of English. <laughs> and people in Mexico speak in the tongue of Spanish. And people in China speak in the tongue of Chinese. Yeah. Can we go on? Pastor Ross, that's what you believe, but, but, but we, we're taught something different. Well, the Bible teaches one thing very plainly here. The Bible says in verse number 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every what? Nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them, uh, heard them speak in his own what? Is there any doubt now? Should there be any doubt? No. Tongues and languages are one and the same. They heard them speak, and everybody came together because everybody's hearing them speak in their own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Hey, the, the preachers are all from Galilee. How, how are they speaking in my language? They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not from my neck of the woods. They're not from my nation. They're not, for, they're, they're not from my neighborhood. They're not, they don't talk my, my language naturally. How are they speaking in my language right now? And just so there's no confusion about this, God goes on and lists all the different languages and all the different nationalities. Verse number 9. Parthenians and Medes, Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt... And in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. It wasn't some unknown language. They were hearing them speak in their own language. So we see that the, the preaching was furthered. How was the preaching furthered? By this wonderful miracle whereby these disciples who were in one place, in one accord, that were filled with the Holy Ghost, God gave them a special gift to be able to speak at that moment in a language that could be understood by people that were gathered together from all of these different nationalities that were assembled there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. It was a unique setting and a unique opportunity, and God moved among the disciples there who were yielded to him and furthered the preaching of the gospel so that these people could understand the gospel in their own language. And the Bible says in verse uh, uh, 12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. So they were trying to explain it away, much like our culture does today. Let's explain the things of God away. Let's explain miracles away. Let's find some science behind that. I've seen some of those shows on TV, uh, uh, science describing the Red Sea miracle. Science describing the, uh, the plagues of Egypt, and, and they, they, they try and they set out, or, or science describing uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then I watched the shows and just scratched my head and said, you know, that's not the way it happened. God did that. Well, some asteroid came and hit the earth and only blew up one city and, and the five cities in the plane and left the rest of the world untouched. And Nonsense. God rained down fire and brimstone because he commanded it to happen that way, and that's the way it happened. And God caused the great east wind, and guess what? It was that east wind at God's direction that gave the, uh, the, the Hebrews a way over the Red Sea on dry ground. It was God that was commanding things and God orchestrating things that had those things happen. They, they, they're trying to find science behind that. It's not science. It's miraculous working of an almighty God. Amen. And in the same way, there are people that are criticizing that and, 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 and scoffing at that and, 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 and mocking that. And Peter said, you know what? He said uh, in verse number 14, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, I be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. 
But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see uh, uh, visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so he, he's saying, look, he said it's just a fulfillment of prophecy here. So what are we seeing so far? We've seen that the, the promise of God has been fulfilled and the Holy Spirit has come and empowered them. We see the preaching has been furthered here by this wonderful miracle of these people being able to speak in foreign languages previously unknown by them. But we also see the plans of God being finished here or finalized in their presence here. Look with me if you real quick in verse number 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Let me just stop right there. What are we seeing here? We're seeing here that God's plans were finalized in Jesus Christ. He said, hear these words, and these words have to do with Jesus Christ. Why do we gather here today? We don't gather here today to celebrate our Baptist heritage. We don't gather here today to celebrate religion. We gather here today to uh, enjoy the privilege we have because of everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. We come here to, 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 to commune around our shared faith in this one named Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Peter was doing for them. He said, you know what? Hold on, guys. He said, here's what everything means today. Here's why the the speaking in in your own language so you can understand this. You need to understand this is all wrapped up in one person. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the one that, that, that has brought this all together. He is the one that has finalize God's plans. Let me just say this. God's plan was when, was simply this. When Adam and Eve went astray, when Adam sinned and God laid the sin upon Adam, the Bible says, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. We were all under the, the boot, uh, the heel of sin and death. God had a plan to deliver us from sin and death. And that plan was finalized when Jesus Christ was sent. Let's take, a, let's take a real quick look, and I will not be long this morning, but I need you to listen on purpose because I'll go fast. You know it. And just listen to what Peter was telling them. He was saying, first of all, that Jesus Christ was approved of God. Approved of God how? By miracles and wonders and signs, the Bible says in verse 22, which God did by him in the midst as ye yourselves know. He said, you know what? With the things that Jesus Christ did, they weren't to entertain you. The miracles that he performed were not for your amusement. He did those things to show that he was approved of God. He did those. Let me just say this. Jesus Christ did not, was not a circus monkey. Amen. He was not there for a religious prop to bring money into somebody's coffers. Amen. Pastor, you really don't like modern religious TV. No, I do not. Most of it I cannot stand because it's untethered from Scripture. Amen. And it's a money-making adventure for most of them. You discern. Do I'll, I'll, you guys have any questions? I'll tell you who I think are pretty decent, but there's a lot of them that aren't worth the electricity it takes to power your flat screen. Amen. Jesus Christ was approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst, as you yourselves know. The Bible says, and, and, uh, and, and when they saw some of these miracles, especially the, when Jesus Christ raised a man off of his, uh, his bed of sickness in Matthew chapter 9, the Bible gives us this testimony. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. He was approved. When they saw what he did, they gave glory to God because they realized it was the power of God working through him. And, and in John chapter 14, Jesus said these words, Believest thou not that I am, uh, that I am in the Father and the Father in me? He said, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. He said, you can either take my testimony, and the words that I'm speaking is from the Father, or if you won't believe my words, just check out what I've been doing and realize these have been done by the Father through me. So believe me for the works' sake. So Jesus Christ said, look, I've got words and works. Take your pick of what you believe, but, but they're both from God. And they'll both point you to the fact that I am God. Amen? So we see that Jesus Christ, first of all, Peter's saying, Jesus Christ was approved of God. Not only was Jesus Christ approved of God, but Jesus Christ was delivered by God. And then we'll say it this way. Look at verse 23 again. 
Him, talking about Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So Jesus Christ was delivered by God. He was offered up by God. It was God's plan to produce Jesus Christ for us. What do you mean, Pastor Ross? We needed a Savior. We could not save ourselves. Why? Because we were sinners. We were held captive by sin. And if you're held captive by something, you can't produce your own ransom. He was the ransom that God offered up for us all. He was delivered by God. And let me just say this. As we look at verse 1 and 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Remember what Brother Hiltabittle said about history, how we look at history? We look at history along the uh, horizontal plane and how God looks at history. It's just a straight line. God knew everything was going to happen from the end to the beginning. That's why Jesus Christ is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. He's before everything and he'll be after everything. Amen. He knew it was going to happen. And before the world even began, Jesus Christ said, I know it's going to happen and I am determined I will go and be the Savior that, that, that mankind needs to save them from sin, death, hell, and the grave. And I will willingly go and I will offer up my body as a sacrifice for their sins. I will allow my body to be bruised and whipped. And, and, and beaten. I allow my beard to be plucked off my face. I allow a crown of thorns to be jammed on my brow. I allow my body to be nailed to a rugged cross. I allow my body to, to, to suffer death for the sins of mankind. I will be bruised for their iniquities. And I'll, 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 with their stripes, I will heal them. He did this before the world even began. There's a God that saw our need even before it became a need. Before mankind ever was, Jesus Christ was Savior. Before God ever breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, Jesus Christ had already been determined to go to Calvary at the appointed time. When the fullness of time came, Jesus Christ was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when the time was right, Jesus Christ, after fulfilling all of Scripture, laid down his life on the cross. Amen. And with these last words, before he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, said, It is finished. Amen. That plan was developed and designed before mankind ever was. Amen. Uh, some of you don't get that, but you need to. That's how much God loves us. He met the need, the greatest need we'd ever have, the need of a Savior, even before He even created mankind. Jesus Christ was Savior. Him being delivered by the... Again, look at verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined counsel, determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God had already predetermined it and, and already predesigned Jesus Christ to be our Savior. So He was delivered by God. Jesus Christ tended at this and talked about this openly in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 18, 31, the Bible says, He took unto Him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge Him, and put Him to death, and the third day He shall rise again. He said this before they went to Jerusalem. Before, even before Palm Sunday came, he said, this is what's going to happen. And in Luke twenty two twenty two, he said this uh, in the upper room, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So he said, truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. Amen. That's why when Jesus Christ went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed this prayer, prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What was God's will? It was already predetermined that Jesus Christ would come to this world, be born as a man, live life as a man, be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, and then go to the cross and lay down his life for us. That was the will of the Father. Amen? So he was delivered up for us. Amen? He was approved of God. He was delivered by God. Not only that, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Again, salvation is not by putting money in a plate. It's not by following traditions of men. The Bible says we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So the plan of God that was hatched and designed and drawn up before the world ever was, was now made known in their day. And they got to see it all fulfilled that way. Jesus Christ was, a, was um, approved of God. He was delivered by God. He was raised by God. Amen. Let me just say this. There are many people that believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins, but they don't, they don't emphasize the resurrection. There's a religion that, that, that pictures Jesus Christ. And when they picture Jesus Christ, he's always nailed to a cross. But that doesn't finish the story, friend. 
If we only have hope in Jesus Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If the only thing Jesus Christ did, did for us was die for us, we're still in our sins. But now is Christ raised from the dead. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, amen? And because he's raised from the dead, we have victory. Why? Because his resurrection proves our resurrection as well. Amen? So he was raised by God. According to verse 24, look at verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Oh, boy, I can't wait to preach on Resurrection Sunday. Amen? I got some, got some things I want to preach and, and excited about that. Amen? Uh, death could not hold his prey. Amen? Death could not keep him down. That stone wasn't there to keep Christ in. It was there to keep people out. Amen? Uh, but when that stone was rolled away, it was there to prove, amen, that God was king. Amen? And Christ was Lord and Savior. Amen? And what a wonderful thing we have. Our heritage as children of God is this. We have a risen Savior. And we serve that risen Savior. And he is in the world today. And he lives and reigns. So Jesus Christ was raised by God. In, in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, uh, uh, Peter says this to, the, uh, to, the, to the, uh, the folks he is preaching to. And he said about them, They killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are, we are witnesses. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. You go through your Bible, and, and again, that's something that is undebatable. Amen. God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses living, walking among them. It only takes two eyewitnesses to, to historically verify any event. Jesus Christ had over 500. He is risen, amen, just as he said. Christ is risen and he is risen indeed. So uh, Peter is pointing them to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was approved of God. Jesus Christ was delivered by God. Jesus Christ was raised by God. Jesus Christ was and is exalted by God. Look at the in verse 33 and we'll finish here. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. If you drop down to verse number 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I want to say this as, as plainly as I can this morning. Jesus Christ is not some effeminate sissy. He's not some weakling. He's not somebody that was dominated in his time. He is both Lord and Christ. He is more powerful than anything that we've ever seen or that this world or this existence could ever know. He is the Lord of glory. He is as much God as God the Father is. He has got as much power as God the Father has. He has got as much might as God the Father has. He's got, he's got everything that God the Father had. He's got as much knowledge as God the Father has. He's got as much presence as God the Father has. He is everything that the Father has. He said in, in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus Christ does not come behind in anything. He is the preeminent one. He is first of all. He was exalted by God. We see in Philippians 2.8 these great verses talking about Jesus Christ, and, and we're encouraged to have the same mind that Christ had. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And it talks about him humbling himself and taking upon himself the form of a servant. Boy, that would take care of a lot of problems in our life, amen? We'd stop trying to be number one and start humbling ourselves. Stop demanding to be served and start serving. I'll tell you what, it'd take a lot of wind out of our, our prideful sails and cause us to, to humbly uh, seek God's face, amen? Just another sermon, another thought for some today. Amen. For myself, of course. But when Jesus humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, the Bible says because he did this, and Philippians 2.8 picks up uh, here with this, it says, In being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because he did these things, the Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? One day there will be a day when every knee will bow. One day there will be a day when Satan himself will bow before Almighty God and to the glory of God say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And it will be a wonderful day. One day there will be a day when every demon and devil of hell will be brought before the throne of Almighty God and they will be on bended knee saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. One day every man, woman, and child that has rejected Jesus Christ here will bow before that same great white throne and to the glory of God say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to say you and I have a privilege of kneeling today and every day that we're giving and acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord. See, God exalted him. 
and he deserves to be exalted among the saints. He deserves to be praised among the saints and worshipped among the saints, but he deserves to be uh, uh, high and lifted up among his children, amen, and, 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 and claimed to be Lord and, 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 and King of kings and Lord of lords. That's very interesting. When Peter got done with this and all these things wrote on the day of Pentecost, in verse number 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard all these things, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Listen to Peter's words. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's he saying there? He said, If you believe what I've just said about the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to repent. As I described to our Sunday school class this morning, that word repent is a very simple, a simple word. It's a process. Repentance means a change of mind, which leads to a change of heart, which leads to a change of actions. These men, these people in this audience needed to change their mind about what they thought about Jesus Christ, what they thought about righteousness, what they thought about religion, what they thought about their thoughts for heaven. They needed to change their mind. And that change of mind needed to soften their heart. They needed to see that because they were believing the wrong way, they, that they were undone, they were unsaved, and they were lost. And when their head changed and their heart changed, their actions would change. They would come to a simple faith in Jesus Christ. See, there's... We, we, I will say this as, as, as carefully as I can. He said, repent. We need to repent. Before I got saved, I needed to repent. What do, what do you mean? I thought that because I had gone to church, gone to Sunday school, whether I was made to go or not, I went, amen, and mom made me go to confirmation classes and, and, and go through communion and, and take part in religious exercises and stuff like that. Uh, I had to repent of that. That was not enough to save me. That was not good enough to save me. I had to change my mind about what all the religious education had done it was not enough. It was not sufficient to save me. And as soon as I realized that all my religious upbringing was not sufficient to save me, it began to change my heart. My heart began to broke. My heart, was, my heart was in fear because I realized that what I had been doing, what I had been relying upon, I, I remember to this day I could take it to the Sunday school room and to the place where the teacher was standing when she said uh, to our Sunday school class, I can't remember if it was in third or fourth grade, she said, we need to do good because one day God is going to put all the good we do on one side of a scale and all the bad we do on the other side of the scale. And whatever side's heavier, that's where we go. If we've done more good than bad, we go to heaven. If we've done more bad than good, we go to hell. And that's why we need to do good. I labored under that. Amen. Every time I did bad, I felt my scale was weighing down and I felt I was in danger of God's judgment. Amen. But I was so glad for the day when it wasn't, my, my eternal destiny was not dependent upon what I was doing, but it was dependent upon what Jesus Christ had already done. And he took that weight off my back and he took that weight off of my mind and it began to change my heart. And I, and I realized that I needed not more good works on my part. I, I couldn't manufacture enough. I couldn't turn over new enough, le uh, enough new leaves. I couldn't walk a, a straight enough path to please God. But I realized at that point, that God, because of what Christ had done, was willing to save me for Christ's sake. And I realized that I could be saved if I would come to a, faith, a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And that day, uh, that weight was taken off my back when I realized that God loved me and that Christ died for me. And if I would just reach out by simple faith and, and, and invite Christ to save me and, 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 and confess my sins to him, and, and I'd be saved. So that repentance is something that's necessary. He said to them, repent. You need, to change what, you need to change the way you're thinking. You need to change your hearts toward what you believe uh, about, eternal, about eternal life and about salvation. And when you do that, you need to, you need to call on Jesus Christ. Repent. Now, baptism is put in there. Baptism is important. Do you know that more Baptists through history have lost their lives are that one doctrine than anything else? If you go back and study history, more people were put to death for disagreeing about the issue of baptism than almost anything else especially our forefathers, is, is Baptist. Because baptism really gets to the heart of salvation. Had a man ask me yesterday, he said, you know, I got baptized as a little one. I said, you did not. You might have been sprinkled, but you know what? You had no say in that. That was, a, that was an act performed upon, upon you. I said, so was I. I, had, I was sprinkled as a baby. The only thing I knew was made me wet and mad. That's about the only two things I remember about that. Amen? You throw water on a baby. What do you expect him to do? He's like, oh, this is fun. No. Repent and be baptized. Baptism is that identifying characteristic that we are children of God. It happens after salvation, not before. But it, but it happens because it, it shows that we are trusting Jesus Christ. It identifies us, us with him. It, it points us out as one of Christ's followers. You see, Jesus Christ was baptized. He didn't have to be baptized. John didn't want to baptize him. But Jesus Christ said, suffer to be so for now, for it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. 
Amen? It's a pa- he set a pattern. He said, my followers will be baptized unto me. Amen? So when somebody gets saved, they need to identify with Christ. How do we identify with Christ? He didn't tell us to put a sign around our neck saying, I'm a born-again Christian, or wear a John 3.16 sign around, or a, a rainbow-colored wig, or a T-shirt that says, Jesus is my, my Savior. He said, here's how you identify with me. You, you're baptized. Baptism is a, is a symbol, a picture, an ident- identifying action that, 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 that identifies us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter gave them some great counsel. Let me just say, my friends, this morning as we study the day of Pentecost, again, the, the Bible says at the end of this chapter, uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, that, uh, um, I'm sorry, in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so we see that the end result of everything that took place on the day of Pentecost was the fact that 3, 000, about 3,000 folks heard what Peter said, saw what God did, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and followed the commands, the, the, the challenge of Peter to not only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be baptized, and that day started a great day in the history of the church where these folks were added to the church that day and they began to grow and multiply there in Jerusalem and that church grew rather quickly. Why? Because the gospel went out in a very powerful way. My friend, what do I do with all this? Well, realize first of all that uh, God's got a definite plan. That plan was hatched before we were ever thought of, or not thought of, but before we ever created. And that plan all centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'll tell you the same thing that Peter told the day, the people on the day of Pentecost, repent about what you believe about your salvation, repent about what you believe about your standing with God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you're here this morning and Jesus Christ your Savior and heaven's your home, you need to be baptized. If if, if you haven't, amen. And and, and then lastly, to all of the saints of God here today, let's follow him in a manner that's worth following him. I think the great thing about the, the start of this chapter was these folks are all together in one accord in one place. They didn't make excuses for not being there. They didn't, they didn't dream of, of ways to avoid. They assembled themselves together in one place for the same purpose. They had the same heart, the same mind about all the things of God, and God was able to do something great through them. I want to be part of that. Amen? And I need to make sure that I'm not doing anything that would frustrate God's plans to bring about a revival and an outpouring of his power among his people in our day.